Welcome everyone to this new quarter on spiritual disciplines. And before we begin, I wanted to say thank you to our teachers who are going to be sharing the lessons of facilitating them this quarter. They are the ministers, Elder Simon, uh, Uncle Lee Hock, who is unable to join us today. He's recovering from a cataract surgery. And our Deacon Romain, who is uh, teaching for the first time a GEMS class outside, like right behind this wall. Yeah, so... Um, Keep him in prayer as we are in this class here. Yeah, our our sons are in that class, and uh, uh, they are a very excited bunch. Yeah, so we want to thank our worship leaders also, our facilitators, and uh, Richard Foster and Adele Calhoun for their work in this field of spiritual disciplines. So this is the schedule that we have for this quarter. You can see that every week we have a different discipline that we're going to experience. Now, when you look at that screen, uh, I wonder if you uh, notice certain uh, disciplines that you already do, right? Perhaps uh, some like prayer, we all pray. Uh, but there are some that may be a little more foreign to you. For example, for myself, I've never fasted in my life until one month ago, yeah? And so, uh, this is something that I want to learn more about. So, I, I hope uh, it uh, excites you in, in a way, yeah? But before we dive into today's lesson, I thought it would be important for us to um, look at the question of why spiritual disciplines? Why are we spending one quarter talking about spiritual disciplines? If we already do some of them, why uh, spend a quarter looking at so many of them? We live in a world that is broken, right? It is broken in many ways, and one of the ways in which it is broken is this thing called efficiency. Hyper-efficiency. In Singapore, we want to do everything very well. Everything must be number one. We want to get more things done in less time. And when this kind of a culture starts to creep into our relationship with God, we start to ask this question, how can I get as close to God as possible in as little time so that I chop, chop, kalipok, finish my devotional or whatever it is, yeah? We may also start to wonder, I got so many things to do. Maybe I should assess the value of everything that's on my plate and cut out those that have, have less value. What's in it for me? If I come to this church uh, and worship together with this church family, what do I get out of it? You know, sometimes we may find ourselves commenting you know, after uh, a time together on Sunday that, um, hmm, today's sermon uh, didn't really speak to me much. You know? uh, and when we bring that kind of a mindset into our journey with God, we start to be very utilitarian, measuring things by how much they are worth to us. We proclaim that we are the centre of our relationship with God rather than God Himself. And that naturally leads us to uh, ask, what is the bottom line? What's the, the So basically, what do you want me to do? You know, uh, maybe sometimes you may find yourself asking that as we read the Bible. God, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Lah. Don't, don't uh, give me a parable that I must decipher. Yeah? So when, when we see all these uh, things of our world and our culture creeping into our um, journey with God, we start to live a life that is half as full as we were meant to live. It's almost like, you know, the image of God that, that God created us to be is slowly being stripped away, you know, until the flesh, the skin gone, the flesh gone, and you're only left with the skeleton. You know, like in those cartoons that you watch, the person gets electrocuted and you only see the skeleton. And that is really sad. That's not how we were meant to live. Thankfully, through the grace of God, we have a path or a few paths back to Him. Thankfully, by the grace of God, we have uh, stories of faithful men and women of old in the Bible and even after the time of Christ who had certain disciplines they practiced to return to God, to, to find a way back into the garden. And these are called the spiritual disciplines. They've been called many names through the ages, but basically what they are are God's providence for a broken world, to restore the brokenness on, in the image of God in us. Yeah? So the spiritual disciplines, they are not a man-made brand of practices. Yeah? It's not like, you know, uh, let's, say, let's say you want to send your kid to uh, learn music, right? Then you choose between the Yamaha method, the Suzuki method, or the Christophori school, or whatever it is, uh, because you know, I'm a music teacher, so uh, I, I think about such things. And, and um, 
you choose one of them. It's not like that, yeah? The spiritual disciplines are a loose collection of very scriptural practices. And, and there is no one way to, def no one definitive list, yeah? Because why? They are all overlapping practices. Today, we're going to talk about meditation. Next week, John is going to lead us through a study on study. Yeah. But where is the line between meditating on the Word of God and then flowing into study? The line is not very clear. And when you meditate on the Word, you naturally study and eventually that leads you to a posture of worshipfulness. And that leads you to prayer, right? So the dis disciplines that we are going to experience in this quarter are all overlapping. And the best part of it is they are for everyone. They are for you and I as well. Yeah? Just look once again at the schedule. We already experienced many of them. Yeah? And so in this quarter, we are going to take a taster of uh, these 12 disciplines. Think of it maybe as like a banquet where you, uh, or buffet, right? Where you try a bit of everything. Uh, and if you are interested in one of them, you can go back for a second helping. Okay? You can come to speak with whoever is uh, preparing the lesson or uh, with the ministers, and uh, we will try to find uh, a way to, uh, to connect more, chat more, and discuss more with us. And if this uh, is of interest to you guys, uh, we can consider doing a level two for this next year as well. Yeah? So with that, we are going to um, dive into our first discipline, and that is meditation. I wonder what you think when you see this word, meditation. For some of us who have been in the Psalms a lot, you will think of Christian meditation. But for those of us who may be a bit new to this, we may think instead of the Eastern kind of meditation, you know, empty your mind, right? Uh, sit by the pool and hear the water drip, tuk, 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 and then the wind blow, and then maybe there's a shakuhachi sound, shh, and something like that. For those who don't know, that's a Japanese flute, yeah? Japanese kind of a flute. And uh, that, that is uh, not the meditation of the scripture. Yeah? In scripture, meditation is simply to think deeply, right? To think deeply about uh, something or someone, yeah? Rather than being emptied, it's about being filled with the thoughts of that person or thing. Yeah. So today, we're going to spend some time meditating on Psalm 77. And I'd like to invite everyone, if you will, to uh, gather in groups of three to six. So just move around and please turn to Psalm 77. Yeah, Psalm 77. What a perfect number it is to begin our series. So please move and uh, be in groups of three to six. If you don't see someone on your left and right, you should uh, move to somewhere where there's a... Yeah, and if you see someone who's sitting alone, please show them to come and sit with you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so while we're getting into our positions, or, or sorry, into our groups, not our positions, yeah, uh, please turn to, turn to Psalm 77. And uh, once we are ready, can I invite everyone to settle into a position of receiving God? Yeah? All right, thank you very much, everybody. Okay, let's settle into a position of receiving God. Uh, some of us, for some of us, that's sitting upright. For some of us, that's lying, leaning back a little. For some of us, it's closing our eyes. For some, it's standing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just a note for our youth group, right? Uh, for this part, you, you do have to face the front rather than and see the screen. Yeah. Uh, so we, we'll go into groups later. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to uh, flip over to. And Bible, all right. <coughs> okay, and so we are going to receive uh, God and His Word right now. Let's pray. Spirit of God, we invite you into this presence, and we know that even before we do so, you are already here. And we pray, dear Lord that you fill us 
with yourself, with all your goodness, as we meditate on Psalm 77. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I cry aloud to God. Aloud to God. And He will hear me. In this first part, I'd like to um, do a quick recap of something that we spoke about in our series on Jonah, where the Hebrew authors love to write poetry in what we call parallel lines, yeah, or parallelism. Yeah? For our youth, you may be familiar with this sign, yeah? parallel lines. Okay? Parallelism. What's parallelism about? Well, uh, it's about writing in two lines of twos or threes. And it in, it's an invitation by the author to meditate on the similarities or differences between these lines. Yeah? So you can see, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and He will hear me. They are essentially the same thing. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. And in the night, you see the difference, right? You see the contrast there? My hand is stretched out. Oh, wait, if in the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord, then perhaps this line here is saying the same thing. My hand is stretched out. These are the same, right? Seeking the Lord and stretching out are two ways of saying the same thing. Without wearying, without stopping, yeah, my soul refuses to be comforted. This is the same th way of two ways of saying the same thing. Yeah? So this part here, crying aloud, is same word. In the day, in the night, these are opposites. I seek the Lord and stretched out. They are the same thing, right? Reaching out to God and without wearying and refuses to be comforted. They are the same thing as well. So now I'm going to um, blank out the, these two verses so that we can focus on uh, the verses that we are going to meditate on today, this morning. Yeah? So that's the first one is uh, verse 3. Right? I'm going to read it three times with a pause in between. And I'd like to invite everyone to consider the question, what do you see yeah what do you see and specifically what do you see about meditation because the psalmist is going to tell us what he sees about meditation so let's be in the position of receiving god the first reading when i remember god i moan when I meditate, my spirit faints. So let the words wash over you. And if there's one word that stands out, dwell on it. There's no need to rush to the next one. This is the second reading. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. And finally, the third and final reading. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Thank you for joining me in that meditation. What do you see about meditation? This is the psalmist's meditation on meditation, right? He is talking about meditation there. And he is, he is trying to express to us what he thinks meditation is all about. Well, for me, firstly, I see that there are lines of parallel, right? Sorry, parallel lines. How many are there? There are just two, right? So one and two. And what's in parallel with 
meditate. Remember, isn't it? Remember. So for the psalmist, somehow meditating is the same as remembering. Isn't that amazing? You know, I always used to think that meditating involves you sitting down and looking at text over and over and over again. Maybe some part of my memory uh, goes back to how, uh, like, sometimes in those Channel 8 drama, uh, you see the, the monk, a Buddhist or Taoist monk, uh, chanting the scriptures over and over again. There used to be a, a gathering above my, uh, where we stayed, where they would have, like, a prayer, Buddhist prayer meeting, and they keep chanting and chanting and chanting. And I used to think that meditation would be something like that. But no, according to the psalmist, it's as simple as remembering. And who do you meditate and remember on? Who is it? It's God himself, you know. It's not God's word in this case. Of course, there are other passages about God's word. But in this verse, the psalmist invites us to meditate on God himself rather than God's word. Yeah? That one we find later. Okay? It's coming soon. Meditate on the person of God rather than just His words alone. And what does this lead us to? What does meditation lead the psalmist to? He says that he moans. Huh, right? His spirit faints. What's the Hebrew word for spirit? This one everyone knows. What is it? Ruach, right? The ruach. And what does ruach mean besides spirit? Wind, perfect. And, and another meaning? Besides wind, the wind that comes out of a person, not, not, not break wind, uh, but breath, right? The breath of a person, right? God put the ruach in a human being. And so you see that it's connected here as well, isn't it? That when you meditate, it leads you to, uh, in, in the words here, to, to exhale your breath, to exhale your Ruach, your spirit goes out of you. Uh, not the spirit of God, your spirit, yeah? Uh, but put more generally, meditate, meditate, meditating, yeah, okay, sorry, meditating, yeah, my writing is wrong, leads to a response, yeah, a deep response, a deep response of the spirit. Do you see that? When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit, my inner being, my breath faints. It comes out of me. Yeah, there is a response. When you meditate on the Word of God, when you meditate on God Himself in this verse, yeah, you will not go away unchanged. You will forever be changed. The question is how. Yeah? That's great. So that's verse 3. Now I'm going to invite us to move on to uh, the next verse. So for this one, I'm going to blank the screen. Can I blank it? Yes, perfect. Okay, and we're going to do it a bit differently. Yeah? We try another... Um, oops, sorry about that. Yeah. So let's try another um, version of meditation, which is something that the early Christians did a lot. I want to invite everyone to once again be in a position of receiving uh, God and His Word. And let us close our eyes for this time and shema. Use your ears alone. Resist the urge to read the text, okay? So I'm going to do three readings of it again, this time in three different uh, translations. Let us shema the Word of God. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. The second reading, the King James Version. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart 
and my spirit made diligent search. For our third and final reading, the New International Version. Let us Shema, Psalm 77, verse 6. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked. Thank you for joining me on that meditation. Sorry, having con trouble connecting to uh, the Apple TV. John, um, John, oh, is there? Yeah, great. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> okay, so um, what do you shema from Psalm 77, verse 6? Once again, I'm going to blank out the other verses that we're not looking at in detail. What do you shema about meditation? What is the psalmist saying? Would anyone like to have a response? What do you shema? We can have time for maybe two or three. How many lines are there here in parallel? There are three, right? One, two, three. And what is put in parallel with Meditating. Yeah, remembering, right? Yeah? Remembering once again. So again, to meditate is to remember. What else do you shema here? Search. Yeah? Search. Meditation leads you to search and a diligent search. Wow. What else does it lead you to? A response of your of your heart and of your spirit again. Eh? The spirit is popping up again, right? Your heart, your spirit searching, these are the same things. Yeah, your innermost being. What do you shema on what the psalmist is meditating on? A song, right? Yeah? I heard someone say it. A song. The psalmist is meditating on a song. The psalmist is inviting us as the people of God to meditate on songs of praise. Isn't that interesting? I always thought that meditation was confined to just the, the scriptures only, you know. But here he is talking about the songs of praise that he sings to God. And in those days, you could also say this is, uh, was collected into the Psalms, right? Which then you could say now is the Word of God as well. But before going there, let's not rush all the way there and dwell on the songs of praise. How many of you think about songs of praise in your own time? Yeah? Yeah? I'm pretty sure many of us do. I know that many of us do, actually. My mom is really big on that, and I, I guess I, I inherited that from her. And this week, my song of praise that kept going over and over again in my mind, remembering it, yeah, remembering it was His mercy is more. That we learned last week, uh, and unfortunately, I couldn't join you guys, but, but that I heard was a, a really beautiful song, and it is. And I kept thinking about the words of the song this week. Do you meditate on songs of praise that mean something to you? Yeah? I know that our youth have been uh, asking John a lot of questions about what certain words in certain songs mean. What's the meaning of this? You know? and, and how does it uh, impact my, my journey with God? And that's beautiful. And I believe that as we journey through the, 
um, the life that God has gifted us, meditating on songs of praise is something that is so central to the Christian experience. And so that's what the psalmist has for us in uh, Psalm 77 verse 6. Yeah? Let's go on to our third and final meditation of this morning. And that's in verse 11 and 12. And here I'm just picking out all the verses in this psalm that have to do with meditation. But if you uh, are keen, I will encourage you to go home to look at all the other psalms and how the parallels work. Because parallelism is the way that the psalmist brings forth his meditation to you as well. Yeah? All right, let's read this together. We'll just do it once. I will remember the deeds of Yahweh. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Now, what do you hear? What do you observe? What jumps out from this text? What is your meditation? What is meditation according to these two verses? Med to meditate is to remember. Yes, I will remember. The psalmist is very big on this. Huh? Yeah, he wants you to get it. Remembering is a way of meditation. What's another way? Pondering. But I mean, this is in English. Actually, these two words, right, they are, um, they are translated into meditate in many, many different uh, scenarios in, in the Hebrew Bible also. So these are the two words. If you want to, you can go home to check out Psalm 77 verse 12 on Step Bible, Blue Letter Bible. These are the two Hebrew words that uh, are translated into uh, meditate. Yeah. What else do you notice here? What is the psalmist inviting us to meditate on? His works, right? The, uh, okay, not his works. God's work. God's work. We are invited not only to meditate on God's word, not only on God, not only on songs of praise, but God's works. Have you ever, you know, gone to somewhere with majestic scenery, climbed to the top of the mountain and looked down and said, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Have you ever looked up at the sky and see a, uh, the storm rolling in and you go, oh no, that's, that's, that is really going to pour, you know? And there's someone who is, whose power is behind that. Uh, Sabrina <laughs> was just sharing with us the other day that she and Romaine went to uh, if I may share. <laughs> the beach for a Bible study. Wow, so romantic, right? We all should try that no, one day, okay? And then she said, look at the sand around us. God, you know, provides for us uh, and, and uh, um, uh, the descendants of God, of Abraham, will be more than the stars in the sky and the sand on the beach. And we are like that, you know? That's their meditation on uh, where they are, on God's works. That's entirely scriptural. Yeah? So nature brings us into meditating on God through His works. Yeah? What else are God's works besides nature? What else? People, right? God's images. Have you ever looked at someone and said, wow, God is really in that person. God is really in that person. I see God through that person. Well, we have. If you went to church camp on that last night, that's what we said. That's our meditation on how God is making Himself uh, revealed through images, you and I, in that camp and beyond as well. And I remember also how uh, in our seniors group, there's a lot of um, uh, this practice of remembering God's works in our life, in our life as well. And I overhear from our seniors saying that we must remember how God has been faithful to us all these years. Now that's something that the young people amongst us must also learn and practice. And they already do. You know why? In youth camp, I heard uh, uh, quite a few um, uh, mentioning, God was with me through this thing last year. And so when this year I experienced this other difficulty, I prayed and I knew that God would help me because He did it already. Right? He has that track record in my life as well. Meditate on God's works around us and in our life. And so that is um, what we have today on, from Psalm 77. 
Scripture or the psalmist gives us a picture of how we are invited to meditate on God, on His Word, and on His work by remembering and thinking deeply, leading us to respond, a deep response from inside our spirit. Yeah? So let's unpack a bit, okay? Uh, before we close off uh, for discussion or we move on to discussion time. How did we meditate just now? We went through three rounds, right? Yeah. What were some things that we did together? Okay. Your turn to maybe shout out some responses. So, so these things that you noticed that we did can eventually move into our own meditation on our own, at, at home, on the go, and more. Okay. So what did we do? How did we meditate together? Anyone? And then John has the mic. He can move around. Yeah. Doesn't need to be a very cheap answer, just very straightforward, can really. Quick tips to meditation, Christian style. Okay. Shema, yes. We invited everyone to Shema, listen to what God is saying through, um, through the experience and through, the, through His Word. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? What else did we do? We closed our eyes, yeah? We closed our eyes. Does that help us? Does that help you? Yeah? For some of us, yes. Sometimes maybe we can't close our eyes, maybe we're on the go. But having what does closing our eyes do for you? Brings you into a sorry? Focused mode. Yes, you because you cut out the distractions, right? So you are thinking deeply. Meditating is to think deeply, thinking deeply about whatever uh, you are thinking about at that moment. Yeah. Great, thank you. What else works for you? Read it a few times. Yeah, yeah. Just let it slowly sink in. Chewing on it. That's also one of the images of meditation in Scripture. Chewing on it, yeah. Uh, actually, John shared with, John Go shared with John Lim and I about how um, he, he does that sometimes, uh, not only on Scripture, but also on songs of praise. And those words, meditating on it, chewing on it, uh, sometimes even physically as well. If you utter it out or recite it, that's something very ancient, you know. It's not some newfangled, new age thing, but it's something that uh, the early Christians did a lot as well, yeah? Uh, and we see it in scripture, yeah. Right, so, and, and if you um, notice, we also started with scripture, right? Scripture is important. Uh, we ask questions, what do you shema? What do you see? What do you observe? Are there questions we shouldn't ask? <laughs> That's an interesting question, right? One question that I think may not be as helpful as it appears to be is, what is this text telling me to do? Okay, and I'll share a little more about that later. But uh, for now, when you ask, what is this text telling me to do? What's the assumption? That this text is telling you to do something. Yeah, right? So when you read uh, a scripture that has uh, commandments, uh, you may think, oh yeah, that's for me, all right. But what if it's a story where it's not very clear whether the good guy is fully good or, or has a mixture of some evil? What about Jonah? What's Jonah telling you to do? It's very hard to say as well. So uh, that kind of a question sometimes draws the line that isn't there, isn't meant to be there. Yeah. We also settle into a position of receiving God. Some of us enjoy standing when we receive God. Some of us sitting. Some of us like to clasp our hands. Uh, and when I, I was taught that in Bible class when I was a kid, pray like that. Yeah? But some of us like to pray with our hands open because you believe that that invites, uh, it's a reminder to you that you are inviting God with empty hands. God is going to fill you up. And oops, sorry. Most importantly, we also invited the Spirit to breathe upon us His wisdom or to fill us with His wisdom. Yeah? So these are some things that you could do in your free time as well. On the go, commuting, when you're walking, when you're jogging, when you are in the shower, perhaps, yeah? Showering is a very meditative thing for me, yeah? As long as you don't let the water run too long, uh, later your electricity bill very high. <laughs> so that's it for uh, meditation for today. And in a short while, we're going to break into groups to talk about um, 
uh, to, to meditate on meditation actually. Yeah? But, but before that, there's something that I, I want to share with you and that's my personal experience with meditation. You know when I was uh, growing up uh, as a teenager, we had this thing called quiet time. You, you all still talk about quiet time today, huh? Yes, some people do. Oh, the youth minister said yes, so that means they should do it. <laughs> no, no, but uh, I mean, seriously, in my group during church camp, uh, many of you guys actually said, I, you know that shoe activity? Yeah, and they, they, many of them shared that, oh, I feel that, you know, I need to read my Bible more, I need to pray more, uh, my quiet time it needs to be more focused and stuff like that, yeah? So when, when I was a youth, uh, quiet time was something like um, this, like if you do it 10-15 minutes every day and you can say at the end of it, God spoke to me by this and that, wow, you're an A-star Christian, okay? Badge of honour on your side, yeah. And so, um, this came from a very, uh, a place of good intention, but it was also layered on, must be aware of it, uh, with our Singaporean culture, yeah? And it's almost like you open the Bible, uh, it's like opening textbook, no? and you read it, better understand it. Lah. If you don't have any learning point, uh, oh, then you're not a good student or Christian or something like that. You know? So I got very into this whole thing. But secretly, right, I felt very frustrated. No? You know why? Because almost every time I opened the Bible as a teenager, I found it very hard to understand what, it, what, what, what was it talking about. Stories were fine. But when it came to stories that were more complicated, it was very difficult for me to understand. When it came to laws, it was like, why am I reading a bunch of laws you know, or numbers, for example? And so I felt that frustration because I had that assumption that when I came to Scripture, I must get something out of it. But the story of the Bible actually is quite different. God invites us into a life of meditation to think deeply about this grand story. Yeah? Someone may say, wow, so easy, uh, think deeply, God happy already. In a way, yes. In a way, yes. There, there is a time for answers, but that is not the first and foremost priority. That is not the main uh, point of this entire journey with God. He delights when we think deeply about Him, about His Word, and about His work. And that's actually true. You know, I mentioned those two words that um, are translated into meditation. Perhaps at this time, i just show it to you briefly. Okay, look at this. Uh. So this is, um, this word ponder, haga, is uh, often translated into meditation. And I just want to show you what it is used, um, um, how it is used rather, right? Joshua 1.8, uh, this book of law shall not depart from your mouth, you shall meditate on it day and night. Yeah, that's great, right? Let's go down. Uh. Psalm 1, uh, blessed is the man, such and such. On his law, he meditates day and night. But let's look at the next one. Why do the nations rage? Psalm 2. And the peoples plot in vain. Why do the nations rage and the people meditate on evil in vain? This is what the word means as well. Alright? Um, let's see. Psalm... Uh, Psalm 37, perhaps. Psalm 37, the mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. To speak is to meditate as well. All right? But the very next one, Psalm 38, right? those who seek my life, they, they speak, seek my hurt, speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. So meditation, my brothers and sisters, in the Bible, it's not just about God's Word. It's also about God. It's about God's works around us. It's about songs of praise. But to zoom out, it's also not only about God. Scripture shows us that we can meditate on things that are not of God. We can meditate treachery. We can plot in evil. We can, uh, in the other, the other word, when you complain, that is meditating to the biblical authors or so. When you complain, because you're always thinking about this thing that you don't like, uh, about someone or something. Yeah? So when my wife and I uh, were meditating on this in uh, the previous, um, the, in the past week, we were quite shocked when we found out about this, you see, because she said, wow, this opens a whole new world to meditation, you know. Because it tells me that if I enjoy this drama a lot and I 
uh, watch it and then I keep thinking about it through the day. Wow, what's this character going to do? What's this, uh, where's the story going to lead to? Hey, what's the backstory of this character actually? And then you search on, on Google and try to find out all you want to know about that drama that you like a lot. She said, I'm meditating on it. And that scares me because I'm meditating on a drama instead of on God. And in the same way, sometimes when something bad happens in a day, right, and then you keep replaying that incident in your mind, yeah, you keep thinking, oh, yeah, I should have said that. Uh. That person said something to me, I didn't have the right words to say uh, in response. In those times, right, you are meditating on that incident as well. So how do we turn our hearts to God? That is, that is a, the question that we need to ask because the truth of it is that we meditate all the time. The question is, what are we meditating about? Shall we pray? Lord God Almighty, thank you for inviting us into a lifetime of meditation. We give thanks to you that our journey with you is not just about finding the right answers and answering all the questions that there are to be answered, but that you give space for uncertainty. You give space and time for us to just dwell with you, think deeply about you, and to rest in you. Lord, we realize that the story of Scripture presents us the reality of how we can meditate on you and your word and your works, or we could choose the other way and we could meditate on things of this world as well. And it scares us, it scares me. We pray, dear Lord, that you help us to be mindful of what we are meditating on every day, what we are thinking deeply about. And as the apostles write, to hold every thought dear to us in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, um, for if you are keen on more, we have this for more section here. You could meditate on the use of uh, those two words. And I encourage you to do that through Step Bible, Blue Letter Bible, and more. You could also check out this ancient practice called Lectio Divina. It's, there are many variations of it, but it's like a step-by-step -step how to meditate kind of thing. La. Cheat sheet for meditation. Yeah? Uh, and if you are keen on listening or, or reading about someone else's experience of meditation, how they moved from, I need to find all the right answers, to a lifetime of meditation, do check out James Smith's The Jogging Monk. Yeah? So um, he comes from a different Christian tradition, but it's very, very mindful, uh, sorry, my, my mindful, useful for us to, to just meditate on, on his own experience. Yeah? But for now, in your groups, I'd like to invite you to uh, pick one question that you'd like to discuss and um, make sure everyone has a go with it. Yeah? So if your groups are a little bigger, please do split up so that everyone has a turn. Uh, the first one is, what do you often think deeply about and how has this shaped you? Um, if meditation is about thinking deeply, then we could be meditating on somebody you like, for example, or a job that you're longing for, or maybe uh, for those of us who are older, your investment stock portfolio, uh, always thinking about it, checking uh, all the time. Yeah, so you could be meditating on a bunch of things. What does this do to you? How does it shape you? The second one is, describe one condition or habit that has helped you to enter into meditation. And if you're not so familiar with this practice, what do you think might help you as well? So this second question kind of leads to, like, a, if everyone has a quick response, it almost is like a, six things that I could do this week very easily uh, to meditate on God and His Word and His works. Yeah? All right, so the time now is 10, uh, near 20. We'll go to 10.30 and then we'll get a few responses and then uh, we will wrap up for today. All right, so let's uh, be discussing in our groups. Thank you.